And to start this conference, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker. And this is Liz Jolly, who's Chief Librarian at the British Library. And her talk is entitled, or I hope it's still titled this, um, Changing Times, Changing Libraries, Partnerships in Practice. Now, Liz has over 20 years experience in a variety of institutions. Um, she's worked in the university sector, most recently at director, as Director of Student and Library Services at Teesside University, where she worked for 10 years. And she's also a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, or Advanced HE as it's now known. And she's also a Fellow of both SILIP and the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. She's also been Chair of SCONOL in 2014 to 2016, and also Northern Collaboration from 2016 to 18. And I think she's also a Northumbria University alumna. So uh, I'm really, really pleased that she's been able to join us today. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hope that my colleague, um, Claire, uh, Claire Easthow, who's um, working in partnership with me, sorting out all the presenters and, and getting all the right presentations up, is going to um, help me here just to get that, that screen sorted. Uh, in fact, yes, she's passed it on to Liz. So now I'm going to shut up and, and introduce Liz. I hope you're there, Liz, um, and let Liz tell you all about um, what's been going on. I've got to unmute myself, that's my party trick. Uh, thanks, Biddy. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. So for the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk to you about changing times, changing practice and, and, and how that applies to the British Library. As Biddy mentioned, I've spent the uh, past until 2018, I, I uh, spent 10 years in the north of England. I've only just, northeast of England, only just sold my, my house in Darlington. And I am an alumna of, of Northumbria. So the northeast has very much uh, made me the librarian. I am today. So I'm just going to talk to you very much about the British Library and about how we work in partnership with people. Talk about how, um, you know, suddenly, as with everyone else, our world came to a standstill, literally and, and in all sorts of ways, about responses to that and thinking and then move more generally to thinking about, about um, how we can think about working in partnership uh, towards societal renewal and, and towards the next normal or the new normal or whatever you want to call it whatever it is it isn't going to be the same as it was before and i think the emphasis of my talk is very much that none of us have the answers or can do this on our own we are a very collaborative profession and we need to actually use the the um, way that we're used to working in a new context to work together to deliver uh, our services for the benefit of our communities and, and broader society and when i use community that can be local regional national academic public health special and i very much um, am following david lanks um, in that uh, sense in that, that i prefer community to to user Okay, so this is our um, our strategy called Living Knowledge, and you'll see that it comes to an end next year, and we're about to start work on developing a new one, and it's called Living Knowledge. And in that strategy is, is encompassed our mission, which we see, as, as it says there, about making intellectual heritage accessible to everyone. And that, I think that perhaps public, uh, the National Library hasn't always been seen as something that is for everyone. And we do recognise that we've got a lot of work to do in making sure that we are and we are seen and we are used as the National um, Library for everyone. And it is not just about so-called serious research. It's for anyone who wants to learn, to find out and actually to enjoy themselves. So uh, you'll be aware that we are, we um, people think of the British Library at St Pancras, but actually since before the formation of, of the British Library itself, we have a site at Boston Spa, which is the um, which was the former National Lending Library for Science and Technology. And that has 572 kilometers of storage shelving uh, that grows at a rate of 800 kilometers a year and 600 of our one and a half thousand staff are there. So it's a big site. So we very much see ourselves both as part of London and part of the, of the, of the north of, of England. And 
added to that, we're actually developing um, our presence in the north. We're actually doing a lot of work on Boston Spa because it's where two thirds of our collection is. And it is, is very much about where we house the national collection. And we're also doing some work with Leeds City Council on some public programmes at the moment and looking at how we can have a permanent presence in Leeds City Centre. And again, this is about us developing in partnership as, as a, a national library for everyone. I'm not going to read our values out, but you'll see that the bottom one that I've put in bold is about collaborating to do more than we could do ourselves. And again, we are the British, are the National Library for the UK, but we cannot deliver services in a void or on our own. And our profession is collaborative, and we believe that that's the best way is working with our communities, with our profession, to deliver the best services that, that we can. So I'm just going to talk a bit about a few partners that we have or, or why we're doing that at the moment. And again, those are, are, are obvious things um, about why we're doing it. And it's about though being open, about sharing knowledge and developing those networks. So moving on to a couple of examples, uh, three examples with public libraries, our business and IP centre network, our living knowledge network, and, and some work we're doing with the arts commissioned by the Arts Council on a, a single digital presence. And the business and IP centre, you'll know um, those of you who live in, in Newcastle and, and Sunderland, are around supporting new business. And, and there's one in Newcastle that's now about to become business and IP centre northeast, and we'll have um, branches in, in Sunderland and in um, South Shields and so on. So um, we, we're actually expanding that even, even within the, the current model. But you'll see there that um, we're going to have 20, we have had 20 centres by 2020. And in the budget uh, in, in uh, 2020, just before lockdown happened, we were given another 13 million pounds by the government to expand that network. Because as it says there in, on, on that slide, some research that we commissioned showed that for every pound invested, the public money, it through the, the BIP centre, £6.95 was put back into local economies. So that's collaborating both with local libraries, but also actually with, with, with the local economy. Our Living Knowledge Network is, is about broader public library services, lots of events, staff development and, and, and so on. And you'll see some figures there. And I think that one picture that, that I really loved was the idea that, um, that we were streaming into Aberdeen Public Library for, from an event in our, our, um, in our uh, conference centre in, in London. And you'll, you'll see there. And we had a, a, um, a meeting of our um, Living Knowledge Network only, only this week. Um, and um, we are looking again at how we can grow that service, how we can increase um, the, uh, the partnership, the collaboration, what we do together to be more meaningful in a very much a, a changing, changing world. And the final bit of work that we're doing on public libraries, we've been commissioned by Arts Council to, look to, at Council to look at a digital presence in public libraries. And what that actually means is, is changing. You'll be aware that one of the issues around public libraries is that there's over 150 public libraries authorities in England alone. And so actually looking at what we do, look at what transformation and digital means in public libraries is, is, is a big piece of work. So we've done uh, one phase, we've, we've, we've just we've finished a second phase and Arts Council are working with us to decide on, on how we implement some of those, those recommendations. And as it says there, technology, access to resources, communities are, are key themes around, around that. We also have partnerships with academic libraries, UK Research Reserve, and some, some of you will, will know about this. And it, we felt that we actually contributed to some of the work that some of the, the um, university libraries who work with us did on space because we enabled them to um, remove some of the print holdings of, of, of journals that they were, were, were keeping within their building and freed up space for, for different learning and research activities within their university library buildings. It was a project for a long time. It was, the actual service was launched in 2019 and we're always looking for new people to come and join us uh, in there. Non-print legal deposit, again, this is, um, we work with um, the other legal deposit libraries for the UK, and that, that, that is um, the National Libraries of Scotland and Wales, uh, the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and for historical reasons, Trinity College Dublin. So we work with those to actually manage legal deposit of, of, um, of 
print and now non-print items. Um, and you'll see there um, that that is a fantastic resource. At the moment, though, it can only be consulted on um, the property of, of legal deposit libraries. And while um, we are also collecting, we do a crawl of the web once every six months and are collecting everything with a .uk domain name, at the moment that's a dark archive. So there is a post implementation review. And what we would obviously want in the long term is that we optimise access to, to um, non-print legal deposit holdings. So again, the Alan Turing Institute is a government, government institute set up to look at digital uh, manage, management of, of, of data. And they are based in the um, British Library building at, at St Pancras. And there are two um, major projects that we're undertaking with them. And one of them is about um, what's called living with machines and is about looking at the industrial revolution. And there's opportunities for um, individuals to do some crowdfunding tagging of, um, of digitized newspapers from the industrial rev re revolution. And the other one is around data driven, driven libraries. And they have worked with Newcastle City Council around looking at how people use public libraries and, and what that means for the services and, and, and where libraries are actually lo located. So a lot of spatial uh, work uh, done there, spatial data analysis. And again, we haven't got very far with that, but I think that's got an awful lot of potential in looking at, 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 at how we um, collaborate, how we deliver and how we share those, those services. So, as I say, we were doing an, a, a fair amount of partnership already and then those three events, um, the past few years, Brexit, coronavirus and, and, and the death of, of George Floyd, and all three of them have, have um, caused us and I'm sure all of us in, in the profession and, and nationally to think about what we're doing, how we're doing it and, and, and why we're, we're doing it. And like any library service, in the immediate aftermath of COVID, we had to think about how we delivered our, our services. And our business and intellectual property um, service were actually the, the lead in, in pivoting our services to digital and thinking about how we could do it. So we uh, spent a lot, of, a lot of effort from home thinking about how we could deliver our services. And I'm sure as, as lots of you will, will um, have found too, we thought we were fairly good at digital, we weren't. Um, we weren't as good as we thought we were, we had lots of learning to do. So there's some examples of, of what we do. There's um, storage building at Boston Spa where we delivered um, items to help with research on COVID and the COVID vaccine. We put collection guides online as quickly as we could. And again, we didn't have as many of those as perhaps we should have done. And we thought more about our, our online uh, reference and, and inquiry services, which I know a lot, of, a lot of you will have done already. Digital support, we, so for people who, we do a lot of events um, for families, for business and so on. So there are two examples there. We um, did a whole um, uh, initiative around discovering children's books and actually sent packs out into schools and into local communities to enable and left um, uh, sort of suggestions online for people who wanted to do it at home to enable people to get the sort of experience they might have uh, coming into the library, but using our resources online. And the daily meditations panel there next door is around is aimed at our business um, community. And again, a lot of our, our business and IP um, sessions were webinars on online. Some of them free, some some of them not. In the in the same way that we would have, would have um, delivered those uh, face face to face. And again, exhibitions, we, you'll be aware we have, a, have a, a really big exhibitions program. So just two examples of, of different approaches to that. Um, the spare rib one um, was very much about putting the resources online, linking up with, with collections, li linking up with talks that, that, that were there. The Hebrew manuscripts exhibition, um, we developed an actual online tour and sort of interactive tour through the exhibition, working with a sponsor and working with, with a, um, an external company to be able to do that and again so it's not about having one size fits all it's about what we thought worked best and where we could get the support and, and, and the capacity to do to do that they there's our uh, this is our blog on our anti-racism action plan and we committed in July 2020 to create and implement an anti-racism action plan um, I'm the chief officer sponsor for that we have two uh, project leaders on doing that and again that that living knowledge up 
blog update is around where we're, we're at with that. And that is a cross library project that's involving um, staff from, from, from all levels. Also, as I said before, our, our living knowledge strategy is due for renewal in 2023. But what we thought was that um, we needed to think about an interim re renewal in a different world. And so we did an update for living knowledge and we wanted to focus on the for everyone and really make clear our knowledge and what we thought society's renewal should be. And I won't uh, go into, into detail there, it's available online, but I think the key sentence for that is that we will bring people together through libraries. So moving on, think about broader uh, libraries in a broader post-pandemic world. I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is some work that IFLA have done on, on what um, libraries could be doing in, in the um, post-pandemic world. And I think uh, those things around comp copyright, around making sure that we're part of the right, wider effort are really um, good. And our key role in, in inclusion and, and well-being is, is, is well spelt out there. I think, though, that that universal, meaningful connectivity is one of the underpinners of, of, of that, because if we don't have that connectivity, if we don't have that infrastructure that is accessible to everyone, we're not going to be able to have equal um, access to library support, to library staff and to library online spaces in the way that we, we might want. And these are their values for a, a post uh, pandemic world around information, around that connectivity, around services for everyone and inclusivity, around thinking about culture and not neglecting that Again, just as, as um, it's easy to focus on, on health and, and well-being matters, culture can contribute to those. And there is all sorts of research, isn't there, about how reading for pleasure, for example, can contribute to the development of a sense of, of empathy, about how culture, well, events and so on, uh, add to people's well-being in a general sense. So this is about um, thinking about libraries' role in that broader society and about how libraries are a public, are a right, are a public good and access to information to learn, to uh, develop and to be are really and, and uh, to be and to take part in that democratic society are a matter of, of, of public right. So if we think of a traditional model of, of libraries, uh, I'm sure some of you will have seen that, that model before. What I think we need to think about in the 21st century, and I, I'm aware there's a lot more, more print on that, is that a 21st century library needs to be both physical and digital and integrated. And the word hybrid was used in 1990s literature. And I think what we need to think of in a post pandemic world is that it's going to be both and one size does not fit all. And we need to work with and for our communities in deciding what that is. But I would say the key role for staff is around us being, being reflective practitioners. And again, this is a SILIP Northeast meeting. So I would say that, that I wouldn't be doing this job without my opportunity to develop as a reflective practitioner through that SILIP framework. Underpinning whatever we think a, a library it, it, it is, are those three elements there, and I'm going to speak a bit more about them, technology, partnerships and collaboration, and equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, you'll know that that workforce and uh, the, the frightening uh, thing, thing about that, about the, the issue around um, self-identifying as white is that in the population that's 86%. So, so the disparity is there. And I know that SILIP and SCONAL are doing really good work in this space, but there's a lot more to do and we have a lot more learning and listening to do. We need to really think about social class, both in our staff and the way that we deliver our services, as, as, as well as all those aspects of, of um, equality, diversity and inclusion. And think about as we develop new services in that post pandemic world, how we're eliminating effects of structural privilege um, on our, our, our services, on our communities and, and, and on, on the way we, we, we interact with, with them. How are we going to ensure digital inclusivity and not lose those very real gain, gains that came from, um, from uh, the COVID time? Let's not mistake, this has been a hideous, hideous time with some terrible, terrible deaths and, 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 and illness and so on. One of the things that's made us think differently, though, is, is about being inclusively and how digital can enable us to do that. And I think that in our rush to get back to a different normal, a new normal, a next normal, we mustn't lose the, the good uh, ways of thinking uh, and support um, and, and community cohesion that, that came out of that time. 
and we need and, and that whole idea about being both physical and digital and investing in a digital infrastructure that works for everyone we need to think about as, as librarians how are we going to deliver the open environment that, that technology allows in terms of open access open science how are we going to develop that into and balance that with needs of, of copyright and intellectual property and um, yes, in yesterday's observer, Daniel Kahneman, who, who wrote um, Thinking Fast and Slow and has written a new book, Noise, made that comment about AI and how we as libraries help people to adjust to a world in which AI has won, as he put it, again, is going to be a major, major question for us. Again, partnership working. I put this slide in because this isn't just about it being a nice thing to do. It's about... Um, pro um, developing empathy about curiosity, as Richard Sennett says, about finding out about our communities and what we need. And for those of you who work in, in higher education, you might want to um, read the works of Prala Haddon Ramaswamy and the work of Mike Neary at the University of Lincoln in actually co-creating uh, the student experience with students themselves. And there are lots of lessons to be learned there for, for the broader sector. So those are some of the reasons that we think we're going to need to be working uh, towards uh, the new normal um, and working towards, towards rene renewal there. Um, and again, it's around learning um, from our communities, but also from the profession as a whole and us um, playing our part in supporting innovation from across the sector. That's the new Manchester uh, Central Library. And we do, we cannot do it alone. None of us have the answers. None of us can do this on, on our own. It is about learning and working with our communities and our profession and across professions. So think about the next normal. In, these are some, some things that I think we need to think about as, as librarians, about that inclusivity, about thinking, about um, following our, our ethical principles as, as laid down by SILIP about using the right language in terms of, of both um, inclusivity, but also speaking that right language to those in power in terms of being able to advocate effectively for our services, about changing, um, about being true to, to the what library is about, true to our enduring values, as Michael Gorman would have it, but being adaptable in the how we, we do it putting digital and data literacies at the heart of, of what we do in terms of, of enabling people to um, participate in, in democratic society and enable to learn and enjoy works of imagination. About, about building trust with our, our communities, about aligning what we do with the broader uh, strategic goals of our organisations and being clear, going back to language about how we articulate them, and about being clear what we as librarians can bring to the new normal, the value of us as a profession. And it's very easy and, and has been very easy in the past not to um, have that professional confidence. And I think that's something that we, we need to build on and something that we need to get better in articulating. About actively seeking collaboration, not waiting for it to come to us. And about um, actively seeking collaboration with a diverse and inclusive range of partners, not just going to the same old partners or the same old organisations because they're similar to us, valuing that, that difference and, uh, and valuing that difference. And again, looking at structural inequalities and, and, and allowing collaboration to be different in that context. And above all, I suppose, becoming a reflective practitioner and continuing to learn and develop in very changing in, um, times that, that keep on changing. And at the moment, who knows what, what that future will, will, will bring. So for me, becoming a reflective practitioner is one way of future proofing ourselves and helping ourselves to continue and to learn and, and develop. And this is a, a quote from, from David Lanks, who's also one of my library heroes, who's also thinking about how we, um, how we uh, deliver, how we continue to contribute to a post-COVID world. So we must be weavers of communities and mighty platforms for the stories of our members. We must be the vital social infrastructure that engenders trust through principles and transparency. And again, this is a, a flag that was in our a poster that was in our library um, a, a couple of years ago now when we, we were last open. But I think it is about saying that everyone is el welcome in our library. Everyone is welcome in every library. And we need to work in partnership with, with our communities, with our profession and across professions to make sure that the world truly is, is welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. That was great. Brilliant. Lots and lots of great ideas. And, um, and I like the idea of that vital social infrastructure. That's mm -hmm. so important, isn't it? Now, we've got seven minutes. <laughs> um, I'll to, over. That's all right. No, no problem. We've got seven minutes to go through some questions. So what I propose to do, I'm looking at the chat and I'm going to just read out some of the questions. I'm going to start at the top and then go through and see how we get on, if that's OK, Liz. So the first question um, is, is about community. So you mentioned at the beginning um, that you preferred the, com the word um, community um, uh, compared to user. And that's interesting because I think I use user. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> um, so they're very interested if you could share some insight into this and what led you to prefer this term community. I think, um, I, so I don't have any more insight than anyone else. My, my personal view is, is that um, reading, um, as I said, David Lanks is, is my hero, reading Michael Gorman, um, reading David Lewis. A lot of the reading I do is thinking about why people don't use libraries. And I think user assumes that people are comfortable and um, and go in and, 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 and use the library. And that's not true, is it? And, and, and um, I think we do a lot of, of um, and in higher education where I spend a lot of my time, um, the whole idea about user education seemed quite, quite an outdated thing when this was about enabling students to learn. And, and I think libraries are about learning. And I think that if user for me, and, and it's, this is just my, my, my thinking, suggests that we're waiting for people to come in and then we can teach them, so, so, suggests a sort of didactic approach. Whereas for me, the uh, whole idea of community also links in with learning communities, with communities of practice, with multi-directional knowledge flows and with people learning from each other. So it's around that whole idea of, of equality and, and for people perhaps having very good reasons for not coming into the library, not using it in that sense. And actually us not um judging or assessing what we mean by a a user does that does that make sense so it's about equality about inclusion and about thinking broader than than people who just use our, our, our services so will the british library have a role in leeds 2023 year of culture um, well, you're, we, we like to think we, we work very closely. We deliver a programme in, uh, in Leeds. Um, and so we're working closely with the council and that, that's all I can say at the moment. But um, we would like, we, we work closely with the council on that. So, so that would be a lovely thing to be involved in. Okay, thank you. Right. So the next question, what kind of people use the British Library's business and IP centres? And what kind of queries do you get through the centres? <laughs> Now that's a good, I couldn't answer you the queries in detail. But we have a ref, we have a librarian who answers, a business librarian who answers that. But what we do have um, is that we have some really interesting figures on, um, on diversity um, and inclusion. And uh, you'll see that on that slide, um, on my slide number 10, you'll see that um, of those who started a new business, 55% were women. 31% were, were black, Asian and minority ethnic. And I appreciate that's a, a disputed phrase. That was how the research was done at, at the moment. 29% were aged under 35 and under. 22% were from, from um, what the research has deemed to be the most deprived areas. So what we are seeing is that people who use um, our business and IP centres, and, and this is, is the centre in the British Library, but also the centres in, in, in public libraries across the country, is that we are getting a different demographic. Graphic. People who might not um, want to start up a business or feel that business was for them or that even libraries are for them are coming in and, and using that service. Okay, that's... Well, I think that's been honestly really, really interesting, Liz. Um, I've, I've just I've, I've made lots of notes um, uh, about, you know, the idea of the fact that we need to do a lot more learning and listening. And and I really do think, you know, the 21st century library and the talk of being a reflective practitioner and EDI, which is obviously very important in all sorts of sectors, and the idea of digital inclusion. I think that's not going to go away, is it? That's mm. going to be with us now. You know, we, we're never going to go back to how we were, you know, that the digital has become more at the forefront of, of what we do now. 
Um, so really, really interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you thank you so me. much for your presentation. We've, you know, we've really enjoyed that. And it's lovely to have you virtually back in the Northeast. Thank you. thank you so much. That was a pleasure. And if anyone has any questions, you, you'll see my, my, you've got my email details. So do get in touch. Okay. Thank you very much.